my Bible. It is the living word of God. My mind is renewed and my spirit is prepared to receive the word which produces faith. And faith pleases God. I'm not just a hearer of the word. I'm a doer of the word. This word. Y'all shout it. Hallelujah. Remain standing if you would. Go to Psalm 126. Psalm 126. Again, uh, throughout the experience today, you can tweet me at Bishop Foreman, and I'll retweet your tweet if you use Twitter. And again, we welcome those at all of our campuses today. Are y'all ready for the word? No. I said, y'all ready for the word? Look at your neighbor and say, if you start expecting something, you start seeing something. Most people don't have a faith problem, they have, they, they, but they have is an expectancy problem. So, what, what do you mean? What do you mean that they have a faith problem, they have an expectancy problem? It's one thing to say you have faith. It's another thing to expect that eventually that faith's going to work for you. Now, who's expecting great things in here? Put them up. All right. See, expectancy, see, I could say nothing but Jesus, but if you're expecting, me saying Jesus will shift something in your life. Hallelujah. Psalm 126, verse 5. Let's read this together, actually. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. Now, stop. Now, this is interesting because you would think that if you sow tears, you just get more tears because seeds reproduce naturally after their own kind. Not so in the scripture. The scripture says if I sow tears, what I'm going to get back for that is joy. Which means that many times my harvest is different and greater than the seed that I sow. You, you, you sow tears. That, that means weeping. Say weeping. Well, weeping means disappointment. So watch this. Those who sow disappointments. Anybody have been disappointed in here? Those that sow or go through disappointments. Don't, don't worry about that because you're going to reap joy. What's the joy? The joy is I'm not going to always be disappointed. Look, look at verse 6. Look at verse 6. It says, it says, he who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless, that means you can take this to the bank, this is a promise, come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Encourage somebody next to you, say, neighbor, my friend, hear me and hear me well. Everything that you think you've lost or you think you've wasted, you actually sowed it as seed. That, that's a good place for, for people that love Jesus to shout. Anybody in here ever lost something? Anybody ever here after ever felt like you wasted your time and your energy? And your, I mean to tell you, you didn't waste it, baby. You were just sowing it. Uh, now, God, do what you do, how you do, and you do what you do it when you do it for us. I decrease that you might increase. I'm your vessel. Speak now in this place a word that when we hear it, we know that not only have we been in your presence, but we know that you have spoken direction and action for us. Lord, answer questions for people today so that when they hear these words, they know that even though they just prayed about it a few days ago or they just thought about it yesterday and they wonder how in the world does this man know that? Because they're not in the presence of just a man. They are in the presence of Jesus Christ speaking through a man. So speak in this place, Holy Ghost. Do what you want to do. We yield to you. In Christ's name we pray. Somebody shout hallelujah. Took somebody next to you as you take your seats. Tell them, I didn't waste it. I sold it. I didn't waste it. I've taught on Psalm 126 before in the teaching dream again. Uh, but God spoke something awesome to me in a response to a question that I had asked the Lord. For the last 13, going on 14 years of my life, I have been in the ministry. I'm not talking about since we began Harvest. I'm talking about since I've been in the gospel ministry. And I have dedicated my life to investing in people and changing lives. I laid down my plan to pick up what God's plan for my life was. And for some of you, you've heard the story that it wasn't my plan to do what it is that I'm doing. But God had other plans. Are you still here? I began to examine. I'm, I am the kind of person who's built to where if something's not working, I don't want to keep doing it. Anybody else like that? Uh, you know, insanity, that by definition, is to do the same thing repeatedly but to expect a different result. Uh, insanity is to keep going back to the same relationship that you know is jacked up but hope that somehow, some way, it's going to be different. 
yet there's been no change in the individual. So if there's been no change in the individuals, there can be no change in the relationship. It got real quiet right there. Somebody say insanity. And, and so many of us, sometimes we get in these cycles of insanity where we do things that do not work, yet we continue to do them as if they, we think they're going to work. And, and, and I try to be as, as different from that as possible. I'm the kind of guy that likes results. Anybody else likes results? I'm the kind of guy that I want to see something happen. I can walk by faith, but after walking by faith, I need to see something happen. If I'm doing something for you, I need to see that it's benefiting you. I need to see something. You got it? And so I began to ask myself this question. I, I began to examine some of the investments in people in which I had made and which copious amounts of time and money and energy were invested. And it looked to me at the moment like those investments were made for nothing. Have you ever done something for somebody and you thought, well, I know I'm really going to help them out for them only to be back in the same scenario a few months later and think, why in the world did I even waste my time making this kind of investment? And so in that, I began to think to myself, I have done all of this and I've done it for nothing. And I had a David moment. Say David moment. You, you know a David moment. You know David in the Bible. David in the Bible, he has these great experiences with God. And then in the next chapter, it's almost as God, God has just thrown him to the wolves or something. So in one verse, David will say something like, Surely goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. He's preparing a table for me in the presence of my enemies. And then in the next chapter, David might say something like, Lord, why in the world have you thrown me out to my enemies? And why are they conquering me? Why did you do this to me? Selah is a derivative of a man. Anybody ever had a David moment where, where it's like you're vacillating between you're going back and forth and one moment you're on top of the mountain and you're excited and you're believing that great things are going to happen and you're expecting the great and the blessing is on you and then in the next moment you're looking around and saying God but why is this like this and why did this happen and why this and God if you love me why did you let this happen and why did you let so and so am I talking to anybody has anybody ever had a David moment in your life and so I had a David moment man and in my David moment I asked the Lord if he was going to let all of the time and energy and money and brain cells and prayers that were invested in some of these jokers, was he going to let me just lose all of that? I said, God, you, you, they're just going, all that, all of what I've done, and it's just gone. I just wasted all that time. I said, Lord, you're going to let them get away with that? See, I know how to read my Bible. See, the Bible says that, that vengeance is here. So I learned how to just stay back and ask him the question. So I said, God, you're going to let them assassinate us. In the country, in the South, when, somebody, when somebody's against you, we call them assassinator. Because they'll assassinate your character. They'll assassinate your integrity. They, they'll assassinate everything about you. See, some Christians are like the mafia that when you find out too much about them, they want to kill you. You met folks like that, that while they were low and down and all of this and at the bottom of their rope and they were telling you and you were their prayer partner and you were helping them and you were counseling them. And, uh, I'm not talking to anybody. But then all of a sudden when things started to get good for them, they forgot about how you were the one that walked through the valley with them. And so now they look at you crazy and strange upside your head and you're trying to figure out, well, wait a minute. So I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, you, you, I, I have invested all of this, and it seems like I have done it for absolutely nothing in certain cases. And sometimes you can go through certain situations and things in life, and at the conclusion, you can think to yourself, why did I waste so much? What I love about the Lord is when you ask a question, normally he gives you an answer. He's not obligated to do that, but when you ask a question, he gives you an answer. And the Lord answered me, and he said, son, is that what you think you did? He said, do you think that I let you spend all that time and that money and that energy and pull people out of their messes and teach them how to tie their tennis shoes and teach them how to brush their teeth? And invest all of that energy and all of that in people. Do, do you think I let you do all of that? Some of you are saying, oh, he just means that figuratively. No, literally, some of them did not brush their teeth. I teach them to brush their teeth. <laughs> but most of that I've been figured. You help people. You build people up. 13, going on 14 years of my life, that's what I've been devoted to doing every day of my life. And I, I had a David moment. Say David moment. And God said, is that what you think you did? Do you think that I let you do all of that so that at the end of it, it be for naught? Here's what he said to me. He said, son, hear me and hear me well. You did not waste anything. 
You didn't waste one dollar. You didn't waste one minute. You didn't waste one prayer. He said, what you did is you sold it. Uh, <laughs> but my specific question, he said, you didn't waste one moment on investing in prodigal spiritual sons and daughters. You sold it towards real and faithful ones. So let me speak now to you. When you are a Christian, nothing is wasted or lost. It is always sown. Which means what you really are is a farmer. You're a farmer. That's what you are. And all you're doing every day, even though it may look like you're losing something or you're wasting something, what you're really doing is you're sowing. Tell somebody say, I've been sowing. When you're a Christian, nothing is wasted or lost. It is sown. Everything that seems lost or wasted was really a seed. And here's what I know some of you are thinking, oh, but Bishop, no, that was a seed. But don't you know that bad mistake I made and this I made and this I made, that, 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 that wasn't a seed. You better read your Bible because the scripture says in Romans 8, 28, that God has a way for people that love him. Anybody love him in here? God's got a way of taking all things and making them work together for your good, which means God will take the good and he'll take the bad and he'll take the ugly. And somehow he's got a supernatural way of mixing that stuff up and making it work for your good. It does not say he'll make all things work. He says he'll make all things work together. Which means God can take your depression and he can make it work together with something else. God can take your low self-esteem and your insecurities. And God can take that and make that work together with some other stuff and end up making it work for your good. Nothing when you're a believer in Jesus Christ is wasted or lost. It's only sown. Say, I'm a spiritual farmer. No, 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 no. Watch this. Three things you need to know real quick about this, about this. First thing is, there are only two seasons of life. It's the first thing you need to know. There are only two seasons of life. Some of you watching online, you're thinking, no, wait a minute, Bishop. No, because you have seasons. No, 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 no. There's only two seasons. There are no more. Now, this seems a bit, little bit perhaps counterintuitive because in nature, we think of how many seasons? Four. Fall, winter, spring, summer. But the scripture doesn't record seasons that way. The scripture records seasons in contrast to one another. So Genesis 8.22 says, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night shall not cease. Notice in this scripture, there is nothing about uh, spring. There is nothing about uh, uh, fall or these transitional times, w w which means, say, there are two seasons in my life. Now, here's, the, here's what they are. You are either in a season of sowing or you're in a season of reaping. Or you can call that seed time and harvest time. Now, 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 watch this. Right now, sitting in this place or watching on the Internet campus, you are in one of those two seasons. There's no other ones that you can be in. You're either in a season of sowing or you're in a season of reaping. So sowing sometimes looks like this. Maybe things aren't really going as great as you'd like right now. That means you're in a season of sowing. There was a time in my life where uh, I had a secular business, and in that business, I, I began to uh, 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 produce a lot of, of quantity in, in terms of the things that we did. But for, for months and months on end, uh, it's all of the production I was doing, it never came out the other end of the pipeline. So I was working hard, but I never saw any fruit from the work that I was doing. Uh, anybody ever been there where it seems like, God, I'm doing all the right things, but I'm not getting nothing right back? I wish I had somebody that'd be honest with me. And so I was, I was working hard, I was working hard, and, and nothing was coming out the other end of the pipeline. I was the top producer in the company I was a part of, but nothing was coming out the other end for me. And so in that time, I had to go and get a little job. I, was, I was doing, got a little clerical job where I had to dress up in my Sunday's best, and I had to go there to staple and fold and collate and stand in front of that copier and run copies and put stuff in envelopes and lick envelopes and put stamps on envelopes. And they didn't even have, it wasn't, no, it, wasn't, it wasn't no updated system like we got now where you got the little ball you can roll the stamps on. And, and we didn't have sticky stamps that, no, mm -mm, you had to lick these. No, they didn't, we didn't have a, 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 a you know, little thing you put some water in and then you said, no. So I licked hundreds and hundreds. By the time I left, I had looked like I was bleeding out the mouth. Just, I licked hundreds and hundreds down below. And I had to do that. And all that time I'm thinking, wait a minute, God, I'm working hard but I'm not seeing any fruit or results from the work that I'm doing. But I was in a season of sowing. Now notice what the scripture says. Seed time and harvest. Sowing and we See, the problem most of us have is that we get stuck in and. 
And so when we get stuck, and is the transition in between your seed and in between your harvest. So I got, I got, I got a little frustrated while I was in my am time because I'm saying, God, this is ridiculous. I've got, I've got tens of thousands of dollars of production over here and nothing's coming out on the other end. God, what in the world is going on? But because I kept on sowing in my season of sowing, eventually I got to a season of harvest. Did you hear what I just said? And it seemed like instantly God opened up the floodgates, man. And when he opened them up, he opened them up big. And it went, in a small amount of time, I saw more financial increase in my life than I'd ever seen before. Why? Because while I was sowing, I knew that I had to go through my and. See, and may look like, God, I'm praying, but ain't nothing happened. God says, and. Y'all ain't going to say nothing. See, your and season is, God, I'm loving people, but they're not loving me back. And, God, I'm giving, but I'm not getting anything back. And, see, you got to learn how to survive your and. Because after seed time and, there comes a harvest. I wish there was somebody in here that said, Bishop, I'm going to survive my and. I, I'm going to survive my and. I'm not going to grow weary in well-doing because I know that in due season, I'm going to reap if a fate not. I was, I had to make it through my and so I could get to my harvest. See, so sowing may mean that maybe things don't really look as good as you'd like. But reaping is when you see God do things that are bigger than you could do for yourself. See, it's not really reaping if you could do it for yourself. Reaping is when you see God do things that are bigger than you. And the only thing you can do is say, to God be the glory. Man, how in the world did that happen? I can't even tell you all. They're just Jesus. Just, anybody ever had one of those kind of breakthroughs in your life where somebody said, well, how'd you get that job? How'd you get that? Man, I don't even know. Just God did that thing. Let me, let me paint the picture a little bit more eloquently. So sowing many times is spent in the trenches doing intensely hard work and maybe even feeling like you're struggling, but you're still faithful to God. You ever felt like, you ever felt like the more you do for God, the more you struggle in life? It's okay. You can be honest if you ever felt like that. You, you ever felt like, God, the more I go to church, seems like the more my life fall apart. You ever, you ever felt like that? Come on. Can we just have an honest conversation with them? You ever feel like, God, the more I pray, the more things just seem to go crazy. So, God, I don't want to pray because I don't want nothing to go crazy. Everybody in a been there? You, have, you were in a season of sowing. And you can't get stuck in your sowing because after sowing comes and. But if you can survive your and, I'm here to tell you there's a harvest that's coming. Sowing, 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 sowing. Let me paint the picture. Let me paint the picture. Reaping is when you see a return on the work. Watch this. Sowing can feel like a valley, but reaping is the mountaintop. In, in geography and in topography, in, in all of this, in our landscape, what you find is that uh, most normally, and uh, you will find that um, mountains are preceded by valleys. Mountains are preceded by valleys. So here's how it normally looks. There's a valley, then there's a mountain, then there's a valley, then there's a mountain, then there's a valley, then there's a mountain. Have you ever taken a look over there to the west to see what I'm talking about? There's a valley in between every mountain. That's the way that it works. Without a valley, hear me, there is no mountain. You didn't hear what I just said. Without a valley, there is no mountain. And so the seasons of sowing in your life, that's where you're like David, where you're saying, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Now, maybe your shadow is not death, but maybe it's financial ruin. God. See, the shadow is just something that seems real scary. You, 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 I know not you because, because you've always been very strong, but you knew somebody when they were growing up that they were so scary that they were scared of their shadows. I mean, you ever met somebody that's just scary? I mean, you, you touch them on the, you know, they're just scary acting. See, the, the shadow in the valley is whatever it is that you fear the most. Whatever it is that you're saying, God, please don't let that happen to me the most. Do you understand? So when you're in the valley, you're going to see shadows of stuff that are the things that you fear the most. And God says, but baby, if you can keep on walking through your valley and don't get stuck in your valley, right after your valley, there's going to be a mountain. It's not an issue of if, it's just a matter of when. Does your neighbor say, thank God for your valley. Thank God for the moments where you didn't know what you were going to do to eat. Thank God for the moments where you didn't have money to make it to the end of the month. Thank God for the valley moments because it's the valley that gets you to the mountain top. See, you know how to praise God for when you get up here. My question is, can you praise him when you're down here? Can you bless him when you're down here? 
So the psalmist said, I will bless the Lord when? At all times, even when I don't understand what he's doing to me. Look at this, look at this. There are how many seasons in your life? Two. Now watch this. Don't rust the seasons. Because if you, watch this, if you don't sow everything you're supposed to, you won't reap what God intended for you to. Ask Job about that. You, you know the story of Job. Job was a wealthy man. He, he did well. He was perhaps the most uh, 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 wealthy man in the entire region, the entire zone that he was in. And uh, the scripture records that one day there's a meeting in heaven, and Satan is amongst that meeting. And the angels are there, and, and God says, what's going on, Satan? Give me your status report. What's happening? And he says, oh, I've just been walking on the earth, just, you know, looking around, checking things out. And then out of nowhere, God, 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 my God, God volunteers. Job, he says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Hear me. Anytime God volunteers you for trouble. It's because he's volunteering you to sow. Well, why would he do that, Bishop? Because without any seed, there can be no harvest. So sometimes the only way God can get the seed he needs out of you is to allow you to go through some trouble. Because trouble has a way of shaking some seed loose from you. Are you still here? Now think about this. Think about this. God, at the end of the story, gave Job double of everything that was lost. And so preachers, they'll take it and say, he gave him double for his trouble. And people would tear the church up but you, you, because they sound about to double. But they, they forget the, the B part of the phrase, for his trouble. So in, watch this. Job's trouble really wasn't just trouble because he lost everything except his crazy wife. He said, Bishop, he said, Bishop why do you call his wife crazy? Because she was. She said, why don't you just curse God and die? She crazy. Anybody that'll tell you, I don't know why you go to church, they're crazy. I don't know why you're paying your tithes, they're crazy. I don't know why you get to that church, they're crazy. And you better let their crazy self run on. When you see crazy crumbing, you better learn how to cross the street. See, that certain folk, I see crazy coming. Ah, ah, time for me to walk over here. Let me get over here. Crazy coming, crazy, crazy, crazy coming. So Job's trouble, watch this. Got him what? Double. But to reap something, wouldn't that mean that you had to first? Which means that his trouble was really a seed. So the reason why you don't want God, God, please get me out of this. God, please get me out of this. God, God, if he gets you out of it, you won't have any seed in the ground. So you won't be entitled to any kind of harvest in your life. You want to know somebody God's getting ready to do some great things for? Look at the trouble in their life. Because if there's trouble on every side and they got trouble and issues in every place in their life, that means God says, I'm just having them sow some seed, baby. I'm having them sow some seed. Don't rush the seasons. So you're in one of those two now. You need to figure out. Now how many of you believe you're in, a, you're in a harvest season in your life? Put your hand up. Awesome. Okay, now how many of you believe you're in a sowing season right now? All right, good. Now here's the good news. If you keep on sowing, you're going to be in a harvest season. Don't, don't, don't be like most Christians and then stop, stop sowing. And, I, and let me be very clear because I know how you church people do. I'm not just talking about money. Because I mean, the moment I say seed, he's talking about money. Well, here's the deal. If you ain't got none, you need to hear somebody talk about some money. Let me just tell you like that right now. And if you do have son, you need to have somebody to tell you about some money. Scripture says, 3 John 1, 2, Beloved, I pray above all that ye prosper. And be in health even as your soul prospers. Prosper means to do what? To, it's to be shalom. Nothing missing. Nothing broken. Nothing lacking. All is well. Amen. Now let's get back to our regularly scheduled teaching. First thing you need to know about, I didn't waste it, but I sowed it. Is there what? Two seasons in your life. Here's the second thing you need to know. You ready? Second thing is, your harvest will be different and greater than your seed. A, a harvest always looks different than the seed that was sown. Think about it. If you sow corn, if you sow a kernel of corn, you sow a seed of corn, that looks different than the ear of corn that we harvest. If you sow a watermelon seed, that looks totally different than the watermelon. When you sow them to God's work financially, you get more back. So that means your harvest doesn't look like your seed. I'm going to say that another way. Seed looks different than your harvest. Verse 5 that we looked at in Psalm 126, look at what it says. Those who sow in tears, and let's understand tears to not just mean 
literal tears. But now there are times that we sow those. But tears mean weeping. Well, what does weeping mean? Disappointment. Anybody ever been disappointed in here? You're expecting ABC is going to happen. You're expecting that the person that you want to be with is going to do right to only find out that ain't nothing but wrong in them. You're expecting that you're going to get that bonus at the end of the year to only find out that ain't nobody getting no bonus. And so you get what? Disappointed. You, you, you're expecting that somebody's going to remember that thing that you want them to remember for them only to not remember the thing that you want them to remember. And so now you had your hopes high, but now you are disappointed. So those who sow in disappointments, how are they going to reap? Joy. But no, wait a minute. If I sow corn, shouldn't I get corn back? If, if, if I sow watermelon seeds, shouldn't I get watermelon back? No, that's, that's not inaccurate, but it is incomplete. Watch this. When you're a believer in Jesus Christ, and if you're not, I'm believing that before this worship experience is out, that you will be. When you're a believer in Jesus Christ, hear me and hear me very well. You may sow disappointment. But you're going to reap something that's different and greater than what you sowed. So the scripture says, if I sow tears, I reap what? Joy. Well, that's different and that's greater. Which means this, without enduring the tears and disappointments in my life, there can really be no joy in my life. Okay, I can see we're going to have to work this here. You might think to yourself, well, Bishop, okay, so, so if I sow disappointments, what do you mean by that? When you endure disappointments. If I sow tears, what does that mean? When sometimes the pain of the issues that you're dealing with are, are so great that the only way you can quantify that pain is through tears. You ever been there where you have nothing to say, but you have everything to cry? Come on, it's all right, fellas. You, you can tell the truth, too. I never know, but, you know, I just pray about everything. Come on now. I know you do, but after you finish crying. <laughs> You ever sat and looked at your life and got so angry at certain things that happened to where the anger turned into tears? You just look at it and your blood starts boiling. Before your blood finishes boiling, you cry. Those who sow or endure tears and disappointments, they're going to reap the antithesis of what they sowed. Does it make sense? Because if I sow tears and seeds reproduce after their own kind, well, then I think I just get some more tears. If seeds reproduce after their own kind. If, if I sow disappointments and seeds reproduce after their own kind, then that just means I'm going to get some more. Disapp no, not when you are a believer. When you're a believer, you can sow one thing but get something totally opposite that's greater and better than what you sow. And oftentimes in life, here's the truth of the matter, we have to sow where we want to go, not where we are. We often have to sow based on where we go, not where we are. What do you mean by that, Bishop? So sometimes you have to sow love into people that are filled with hate. Sometimes you have to sow peace into people that are filled with drama. You know drama people because they're sensationalists. Everything is the end of the world. Man, did you hear what happened? In the... So sometimes you have to sow where you want to go, not based on where you are. So, so sometimes, sometimes, sometimes you have to sow commitment to those that are committed to non-commitment. Because sometimes, watch this, if you regard, the scripture says in Ecclesiastes, if you regard your circumstances, you'll sow, but you won't sow where you want to go. You'll sow based on where you are, but the problem is where you are ain't where you want to be, so you need to sow where you want to go. Rewrite, I'm going to say that again. Many times, many times in life, you sow based on where, what you desire to see in your life. So, for example, if you want to be a corporate executive, got it? You say, well, I'm going to start dressing like that as soon, as soon as the Lord does that for me. You, you don't understand sowing and reaping. What, while you work it in the back room and don't nobody know anything about your talent, you're sowing based on where you want to go. I'll start showing up for work on time as soon as they give me that promotion. You don't understand sowing and reaping. You're never getting a promotion because you do a lazy, sloppy job up front. Which means since you can't sow where you want to go, you're going to stay where you are. That'll tweet. 
first thing you need to know about you didn't waste it, you sowed it is what? Two seasons of your life. What are they? Sowing and reaping. Second thing you need to know is what? Your harvest is different and greater than your seed. Here's the third thing you need to know. We're going to put it in fifth gear and go home. Watch this. Tough times produce the best seed. Now, I want you to look at verse 6. I, I want you to look at this because I, I want to be like a physician and take a scalpel to verse number 6. It says, he who continually goes forth weeping. <laughs> Y'all already missed it. He who continually goes forth weeping. Y'all didn't get it. <laughs> he who continually, what is he doing? Going forth. But while he's going forth, he's weeping. You, you miss what I just said. Sometimes when you're in the middle of tough situations, what you want to do is shut down and lock down and stop moving forward. But the scripture says right here that you got to continually go forth. I may be weeping, but I'm going forth. I may be disappointed, but I'm going forth. I may be hurt by what they did to me, but I'm going forth. Because I'm continually moving. I'm weeping, but I'm going forward. I wish there was some. Where are the people that say, Bishop, I didn't been through some things, but I kept on moving forth. I, I didn't been lied on and been talked about, but I kept on moving forth. I went forth. I was weeping, but I kept going forward. He who continually goes forth weeping. Which means perhaps you're the most strong when you think you're the weakest. He who continually goes forth weeping. Which means sometimes you're going to have to press past your tears. You're going to have to press past your fear. You're going to have to press past your anger. And you're going to have to keep it moving. Touch your neighbor and say, keep it moving. Oh, but Bishop, you don't know what they did. Keep it moving. Oh, but Bishop, I'm hurt. Keep it moving. But Bishop, I lost this. Keep it moving. You ain't the only one that's been lied on. You ain't the only one that somebody's done something wrong to. What makes you think so highly of yourself? Keep it moving. Touch somebody and say, keep it moving. But I love that house. Well, you know what? God's got all the houses everywhere. And so he's got the ability. If you lost this one, he's big and bad enough to where he can give you a... Keep it moving. Bishop, I lost that car. I really like that car. You better go get on the internet and find you something new to like. I lost my car, Bishop. I don't know what I'm going to do. Keep it moving. That's what you're going to do. I'm just so tired of fighting. Get you a five-hour energy. Keep it moving. In accordance with your physician's instructions. The best seed comes from tough times. <laughs> he who continually goes forth weeping. Look what he's doing. Bearing seed for sowing shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Now notice this. Seed and weeping are coupled together. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing what? Seed. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing what? Seed. Say it with me. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed. So seed and weeping are together. I'm going to help somebody. The most powerful seed you have is a seed coupled with we weeping. Let me make that more plain. Bishop, what do you mean seed? Maybe it's your time. Maybe it's your money. Maybe it's your energy. Maybe it's your hard work. Whatever it is. If you couple that with disappointment, that is the most powerful seed that you could ever have. He who continually goes forth weeping, but he's bearing seed for sowing. Which means every jacked up thing I go through and everything I lose in life and everything that feels like it's the bottom is falling out. All of that is just me sowing seed. That ought to help you in your life because the greatest problem many people have is they live in a place called regret. Where they look back and wish, oh I wish this wouldn't happen. I shoulda, woulda, coulda. I'm here to tell you when you understand this word, there is no more shoulda, woulda, coulda. The only thing that there is is thank you. Thank you for what? Thank you for letting this happen to me. And thank you for letting them do that to me. See you learn how to learn how to thank God for your enemies more than you thank him for your friends. Because it's your enemies that cause seed to go into the ground. He, he says, the word says, the word says, the word says, the word says, he who continually goes forth weeping 
and he's bearing seed for sowing. So here's the point. Here's the point. Let me make it real pragmatic. Great things happen for those that can handle disappointments. We often look at people's lives, and I, I like watching biographies. I like to see the story that people have to go through because we see the glory. We see the end result. We see the great thing that happened for this person. We see the great thing that happened for this person. But very oftentimes, we don't see the story that's behind the glory. And many times, if you see the story that's behind the glory, you think to yourself, oh, my God, I don't really know if I want what I said I wanted anymore. So you look at somebody on TV and think, oh, wow, I want a marriage like that, or I want a kids like that, or I want a car like that, or I want a house like that. And you don't know all of the hell and tribulation they had to go through to get it. See, just like you, there are people that look at you and say, I wish I had what you had. And you're thinking to yourself, man, if you knew what I had to go through to get what I got, you'd be... But I like watching biographies because oftentimes you see these people go through great, great disappointments before they ever see great victories in their life. You see people, names that we'd recognize, Hilton. And you think, oh, wow, you know, and of course, you know about his grandkids and all this kind of stuff now. But I'm talking about, I'm talking about Hilton, senior, senior, senior. You got it? And, 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 and all of that. And you look at that and you think to yourself, oh, wow, you know, man, that'd be great. I'd love to be. But you didn't know that at one time that man was broke. Didn't have anything. Heinz, the ketchup, ketchup, we, 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 oh, you know, you don't even think twice about ketchup. And when you get creative, you know, you'll put you some sriracha in with your ketchup and make you, put you some hot sauce in with your ketchup and make you a special blend. But at one point, that man, that man, his biography testifies that at one point that man was at the brink of bankruptcy. But yet we eat his ketchup. Decades and decades later, what's the point I'm trying to make? If you can't handle disappointments, you can't handle greatness. Because the road to greatness is paved with disappointments. There are going to be days where everything happens the way you want to. But there's going to be some other days where nothing happens the way that you want to. And the real test of who you are is not found when things are going great. The real test of who you are is in the middle of trouble. You want to know who somebody really is? Watch them in trouble. The real person comes out when there's trouble going on around. You want to find out who your real friends are, go through some trouble. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You want to find out who your real family is, go through some trouble. You want to... But look at this, 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 look at this. Look at this, look at this, look at this. He says, this man shall doubtless... <laughs> now check this out. Doubtless means what? Without a doubt. Now, in our court system, the, 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 the burden of proof is, is beyond a reasonable doubt. Not beyond the shadow of a doubt. There's going to be some shadows all around there, but it may not be reasonable. You ever looked at a shadow and thought it was something to only discover it was something on the other side of the room? So, see, shadows may not be reasonable. But now watch this. Watch this. The scripture says, without a doubt or doubtless. Which means you can take this to the bank. This is a P-R-O-M-I-S-E. Let me translate the R for those of you not familiar with, with a southern vernacular. R. Doubtless means that's a what? A promise. The scripture says, now th this is a good place where you ought to give God glory here. Because the scripture says, the scripture says, the man that can endure some disappointments... That man is sowing seed while he's being disappointed. And those disappointments are going to doubtlessly bring that man back. Which means God says, I make you a promise. See, see, it's not an issue of if. It is simply an issue of when. You can take this to the bank. But what is he going to doubtlessly do? He's going to come again rejoicing. You ever go into a store, or perhaps a locally owned store, or maybe a dry cleaners, and, and on their bag it said, come again? You ever seen that? Come again. It's in red writing. Sometimes red writing, red, red italicized writing. It says, come again. Now, here's what they're really telling you. We want you to come back, and when you come back, we want you to spend more money than you did the last time you were here. Let me say it another way. We want you to come back, but when we come back, we want you to come back bigger and stronger than you did before. The scripture says, this man, now, now, now let me just find out if there's any of this man or this woman in here. People that can endure some disappointments. But keep on sowing while they're going through their disappointments. 
and I just need to know, is that you? Is that you? Then here's God's word to you. You're going to doubtlessly come again, uh, which means you may look like you're knocked out right now, but baby, you're getting ready to have a comeback. It may have looked like you had a setback, but it was really a setup so that you could come again. Touch somebody and say, I'm coming again. I'm coming again. I'm coming again. And when I come again, I'm coming back bigger and badder than I was before. He so doubtless come again. Here's what he's going to do, though. He's going to come again rejoicing. <laughs> Check this out. Re means to do again. Joyce comes from joy. To rejoy. <laughs> to have joy over and over and over and over and over. You don't understand what I'm saying to you because you'd be shouting better than that. So let me make it very clear for you. Happiness is different than joy. Happiness is based on happenings. See, if when you showed up to church today to, and, and somebody told you, you you just won $500, you'd be tearing the church up. We'd have to tase you. It'd be all over the news. I mean, but you'd be tearing that church up. They come out and sing and expect the great. You pick up your chair, you be throwing it around, man. Get by my five hundred dollars. Happiness is based on happenings. Now, listen. Here's just the reality of it. When something bad happens, we're not happy. Let's just be truthful about it. I know, I know. Don't give me your scriptures, all you pseudo super spiritual people. And notice I said pseudo. It means fake. When something bad happens to you. You may pray about it, because that's what the scripture tells us to do. But for a little moment, I wish I had an honest church in here. For a little moment, you're going to think to yourself, God, uh, man. And you know, the truth of it is, it doesn't even have to be something real big to happen. You can let $2 fall out your pocket at the restaurant. Man. Can we all agree that when bad things happen that we don't always feel great about it? All right. Now, you may get over it, but initially we all have feelings of disappointment. It feels bad. That's because happiness is based off of circumstances. But what the scripture doesn't say is he's going to come again re-happy. You, you understand. It didn't say that. He said he's going to come again rejoicing. Joy works like this. That it doesn't matter what's going on around me. It doesn't matter who is coming against me. I have joy. I may not always be happy about the things happening, but I got joy about the things happening. Well, what does joy look like? Joy says if God before me, who can be against me? Uh, joy says, I'm not going to let this going on outside get on the inside. So I may have felt bad about it for a little bit, but I learned how to cast all my cares on him. I feel like preacher because he cares for me. And I, I learned that if I turn it over to Jesus, won't he work it out? Rejoy, joy over and over and over again, which means you could be going through the worst time of your life and just have joy over and over and over. You can be sitting up driving your car and just have a rejoice moment. Where you thank you, Jesus. Uh, everything may not be going the way I want it to, but I just thank you because I may not be where I want to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. Man, I'm having joy over and over and over and over and over and over again. And I should be mad. I should be depressed. I, I should be sad. Oh, but there's just something on the inside of me. And I I got joy. Anybody know the joy that I'm talking about? I'm through. Watch this. But that's not the best part of Psalm 126. The best part of Psalm 126 is this. Psalm 126 is actually a song. It's a song. And it is called a song of ascent. You know what ascent is. Ascent, or to ascend, is to go up. Got it? Descent, 
or to descend is to do what? Go down. Now check this out. This entire passage is called a song of what? Going up. <laughs> this whole thing is about changing the atmosphere and going to a higher place. That's what this whole thing is about. Now watch this, watch this, watch this. In scripture, we are sometimes likened to eagles. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They're going to mount up with wings like eagles. Look at this. Look at this. I, I, several years ago, and i got to move quickly. Several years ago, I was uh, in Anchorage, Alaska. And uh, I was there at, right around this time, actually the end of this particular month that we're in. And uh, in that time in Alaska, because of where they're positioned, uh, at the end of that month, there are 24 hours of sunlight. Literally, the sun does not go down. And where I was staying in my hotel, the sun just happened to just sit right outside of my hotel window. And I mean, it, it just was right there. I mean, just big and bodacious right there outside of my window. I was staying right on one of the uh, bays or one of the inlets there. And, uh, and, and, and we had went, while we were there, we had went and we did a cruise up a, f a little bit further in, uh, uh, north. And, and uh, it was chilly as we were driving up there. I mean, and there's just cold mountains full of snow over here. And there's just cold, icy water over here. And so the whole time I'm praying and all kind of Holy Ghost and everything because I'm just saying, Lord, please, I hope they know where they're going. And please don't let nothing happen in this car. I saw too many movies about people dying, uh, you know, crash landing in snowy places and eating one another and stuff like this here. And I just, I just got all kind of thoughts running through my mind. And I'm thinking to myself, well, if we, we go down, I mean you first. I just want you to know. I love Jesus, but I mean you. I'm joking. If you're offended, please leave. And so we get there, and, and, we take, and we take a cruise. And on the cruise, just like every cruise, there's wonderful food. I mean, there's, there's salmon is fresh. I mean, you know, they, I think I saw them pull one out and kill it and bring it on the back. I mean, the salmon is so fresh. It's wonderful, and it's all kind of food. But I, but I peered, I peered, I got, I got on the deck, and I looked. And as I looked, there were all kinds of orca and all kinds of wildlife that were there. And I looked at a cliff, and when I looked at a cliff, I saw uh, the national symbol of America. I saw a bald eagle. Uh, and, and, and as I saw this eagle, the eagle was there, and, and, and the eagle was getting ready to take flight. But I noticed something about how the eagle flew. He didn't just start flying. The eagle took a dive off the cliff and descended. And right when you think he was going to hit the water, he began to ascend and go higher into flight. No, you didn't understand what I'm just saying. You, you, you didn't get what I'm just saying. In Scripture, you and I are likened sometimes to eagles. But the way that we end up taking flight and going to great places in life is not just ascending for the sake of ascending, but it is our descent. I wish I had a church in here. It is our descent that causes our ascent, which means it is your going down that gives you the strength to be able to get up. And right when it looks like you're going to hit the water, and right when it looks like you're going to lose everything, that's when Jesus will step in and give you strength and give you peace that surpasses all understanding. And then all of a sudden you begin to ascend. So thank God for your descent because without descent, there is no ascent. The eagle can't just start flying and decide to ascend. The eagle has to descend in order to ascend. Which means, if you feel like you're in a descent right now, good news. Good news. <laughs> if you wanted bad news, you should have went to somebody else's church today, but I got good news for you. The good news, I'm not talking to anybody, if you feel like you're in a descent, and maybe it's not every area of your life that you feel that there's in a descent, but maybe there's a couple areas that you feel like you're descending. If you feel like you're in a descent, I got good news for you. And the good news is that it is your descent that is going to cause your ascent. Stand on your feet. It is, it is, it is, it is your descent that causes your ascent. <laughs> it is... In the moments you feel like you're going down, that wind comes beneath your wings. 
so you can make an ascent. Very quickly, though, with your heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe you're in this place today. And you said, Bishop Foreman, that's great. This ascent and descent, and I didn't waste anything. I sowed it. Even my mistakes, God can use those as seed in my life. I didn't really waste or lose anything. So that means I don't have to have regret now. But, but maybe that's not really real for you because you're saying, but I don't even know this Jesus you're talking about. Because the only way these principles work, hear me, is when Jesus is the center of your life. Because other than that, many times when you're descending, that's all it's going to be is a descent and hit the water. But when you're walking with Jesus and when Jesus is walking with you, every descent, he turns into an ascent. There's no other way. It can't happen on your own. It can't, it can't just happen because of positive thinking. It's got to be because Jesus is in your life. And if you're in this place today and you don't know him, I got news for you. He wants to know you. But maybe secondly, you're in this experience today and you've given your life to Jesus before, but you've not been walking with him and you've not been serving him and you want to rededicate your life to him. If that's you, I got good news for you. He's standing with open arms waiting to receive you. Oh, but Dr. Foreman, you don't know all the mistakes I've made. Can I tell you, it really doesn't matter. Because when he was on that cross, he knew about all of that and then some. But he chose to take the penalty for you and I. 2,000 years ago, the gospel is that he died from it so you wouldn't have to die from it. That he dealt with it so that you could walk through it. That, that's the gospel. That's the good news. And today, if you're here with your heads bowed and eyes closed, Bishop, why do you have us do that? Because somebody next to you is maybe making a decision that's going to affect their eternity. If you're here today, and you don't know Jesus. He wants to know you. He's not mad at you. But Bishop, I got all these issues. Let me fix my issues, and then I'm going to give my life to Jesus. Can I help you understand something? If you could have fixed your issues, you would have fixed them a long time ago. You can't do it without him. You need him. If you need to give your life to him or rededicate yourself to him on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to throw your hand up. And when you throw your hand up, we're going to place something in your hand. But here's the good news. Here's the good news. Here's the good news. When you throw your hand up, you don't have to feel ashamed or you don't have to feel bad because guess what? The person standing next to you was probably standing in your shoes at one point or another. But God loves them. See, Christians aren't perfect people that got everything figured out. I don't know who told you that. That's not true. Christians are people with real issues and real problems and real struggles, but we serve a real God that helps us get real solutions. That's Christianity. Christianity is in spite of us, he is. And in spite of us, he loves us. So you just got to get over that and just let him love you. You need to become a Christian and rededicate yourself on the count of three. Throw your hand up and when you do, we're going to celebrate you. This is your moment. This is your time. God did all of what he did to get you here today. Don't miss this moment. If you need to become a Christian or be sure and rededicate yourself to Jesus, do it on the count of three. One, two, three. If that's you, throw that hand up. I see you. I see you. Keep it up. Keep it up. I see you. I see you. Come on, Harvest, let's celebrate. Somebody's uncle and somebody's cousin and somebody's mother and somebody's niece and somebody's nephew. Just keep those hands up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I want everybody in this place, if you're online, I want you to say this with me too. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I confess my sins before you. I thank you that God sent Jesus to die in my place because of that belief. And because of that confession, if this is my first time praying this, I am born again. If I was far from you, I am reconnected to you. Thank you that I discovered that it is my descent that gives me my ascent. Thank you that I found out today there are two seasons in my life, sowing and reaping. I'm going to sow faithfully so I can reap greatly. In Jesus' name, would you just give God a shout all in here? No, I said give him a shout in here. No, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. I said give him a shout in this place. Now listen, listen, listen very carefully. If you just received that gold card, we're so proud of you, and God is proud of you. In just a moment, we're going to give you instructions on what to do with it. If you're online, because many people make decisions through the Internet campus, uh, what you're going to do is click the connection card button right there on the Internet campus screen. Do me a favor as you take your seats very quickly. Hug two or three people around you and tell them, you didn't waste it, you sold it. You didn't waste it, you sold it. 
You can be seated. We're going to see what's happening at Harvest Aurora this week. Thank you for tuning in to today's life-giving message. Harvest exists to change lives by leading people to totally love God, love people and love life as one church in global locations. And if you have a testimony of how Harvest has changed your life, let us know on our website contact us page. We're able to continue to change lives because of the faithful giving of people just like you. And if you'd like to contribute to Harvest financially, you can do so today online at www.harvestcc.me. Remember to love God, love people and love life.